Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com here. It is Monday, the 17th day of July, 2023. On today's update, we're going to talk about that graphic there, the thumbnail. Yes, the Atlantic might be about to get active again. Well, we've got Dawn out there, but we're talking deep tropical development. We'll discuss that. We'll take a look at Dawn, of course. And there's a typhoon headed towards China. We'll look at that briefly. And then all these other tabs that I've got open, a lot to discuss today, including why I was in Rhode Island. Yes, I was in Rhode Island. We'll talk about that, how hot it is out west. I'm getting ready to go out there. Just a lot to discuss. So buckle in, settle in, whatever, and let's get started. First, a very interesting tweet from my friend Michael Lowry. Yeah, the Saharan dust. A lot of people like to say, oh, look at all that dust out there. It's going to choke everything off. We're not going to have a big hurricane season. So, yes, it has picked up in recent days from the historic June lows of Saharan dust. It was at record low levels uh, through the tropical Atlantic. The first half of July was still well below the 20-year average, despite the biggest outbreak of the year to start the month. And it slowly starts to ramp down as we round out the month of July. So look at this nice graphic. Tell you, Michael Lowry can produce some amazing infographics here. The average is right here, and we have been below average. And even now, with the recent uptick, and look, it matched climatology. I think that's important. I mentioned that a lot around here. Climatology is important. We see a spike up when in July, and then it starts to drop off. That's even following climatology. And then once we get to later into August, look out. The dust and dry air, the culprit of sapping these tropical systems for potential development, that will all start to go away. These are just different dust um, infographics for you that he has created. And you can see, not very prevalent overall compared to where we would normally be. And I mean, that first graphic there, this is very easy to understand. So yeah, it's been dusty, but not a real big deal. Now, Let's talk about this. I got some rather interesting stuff here for you. I like it when people prepare things and I'm able to use it. And I credit where these come from, of course. Uh, Eric Blake, who is a Hurricane Center forecaster, posted a tweet. Some of you may have, might have already seen this, so you know where I'm going. This is the anomalies for the gargantuan season of 2005. We all remember that year, right? I certainly do. That is what the sea surface temperature anomaly pattern looked like around this time, mid-July or so, of 2005. Okay, so just remember that. That is 05. This is 2017, the 1st of July through mid-July 2017. Also a big impact year that we will all remember for a long, long time. And then who could forget three years ago, 2020, with everything else that went on, we also piled on top a record-setting hurricane season that year. So again, 05, pretty big, yep. 2017, pretty big, 2020. Now, if you haven't seen this, just please make sure you're sitting down and know this isn't fabricated or fudged in any way. This is this year. I mean, seriously, it's not even close. And there's nothing that's changed I mean, you know what I mean? There's no messing with the scale or somebody with an agenda. It's just facts. It's like taking your kid's height on the door, right? Those of you that have kids and they measure, you put the little stick mark up there with a pencil, right? Five foot two, five foot three, whatever. Oh my goodness, now they're six foot one in a year or whatever. It would be shocking to have that big of a growth spurt. I'm just trying to relate this to you this is a really big deal. And now look, we've talked about anomalies for many, 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 many episodes of this update, yes. But this really helps to drive the point home. I'm just going to go back and show you one more time for those of you in the back, as they say. Those are three big hurricane seasons. Big. Some of the biggest, right? That's this year. So far. Wow. Just wow. All right? So we'll, we'll see what happens. So there you go. So this is the original tweet here from Mr. Blake. July 2023, sea surface temperature anomaly so far versus 2017 and 05. Heesh, he says, hope you enjoy the quiet while it lasts. It's not going to last. I mean, we're going to run out of time here, and somebody's going to have to pay the piper. So this is what it looks like over at the Coral Reef Watch site. There's the El Nino. 
There's the cold, negative PMM, whatever you want to call it. That's pretty interesting, like off the charts almost up there in the northwest Atlantic. That's not going to really help, I mean, because that's going to probably help with these. Well, I just said it's not going to help, and then it's going to help. Let me clarify and slow down. I don't like that look because it could help to create large areas of high pressure up over the northwest Atlantic, and that's a steering thing. Um, we'll get into that later, but when you get these really strong anomalies in the northwest Atlantic, it tends to help ridging. And I'll show you how that could be equating into something in just a little bit uh, from a post over at Storm 2K. All right, so there's the main development region, toasty. We own, we know all this. All right, so let's just break it down. I like it when we have more tools in the toolbox that we can use to analyze this stuff. And we've got the Reynolds map here, and this puts in the isotherms. I really like that. One degree Celsius or higher, all of this through here. All of it. And yet again, just you have to understand, and I don't have a good way to, to, to equate this to you in a way that's easy to digest, but one degree Celsius ch uh, change of water. I got a nice little glass of water. I had ice in this thing when I started about an hour ago. Uh, my office is a little warm. I got some global warming going on in the office here. If this went up one degree Celsius, I probably wouldn't notice. And there's not a lot of energy change in this glass of water, all right? But if you take the oceans and raise those temperatures one degree Celsius, the energy that is stored from the sun, yeah, the incoming solar radiation is vast, all right? And we need like a physicist, somebody, maybe I can get Dr. Maris, one of my UNCW professor friends um, over at UNC Wilmington, he's an engineer, to just, like, what's a good way to equate this so you really understand and then you say, oh, there's two degrees Celsius in there. And then the Northwest Atlantic, this is four degrees Celsius. The amount of extra energy is astounding. And it's available for storms, like hurricanes. In the winter, it can help fuel extra tropical systems, big nor'easters, ocean bomb storms, all those neat names that we've come up with over the years. And then, of course, the El Nino is also an anomalously warm phenomenon. And that helps to raise temperatures overall in the Pacific. So most of the frickin' globe, if we go back to uh, this image right here, most of the oceans are warmer. You got some blue here below average, a little bit here, a little bit here. You get it, everything else is warmer. So there's a lot more energy being stored in the ocean. And that is not good. It's not. It's not good for a variety of reasons. And the ridiculously strong anomalies here, here, this, at least this has come down a little bit. Mediterranean, uh, I don't know what's going on with that, very strange, and then up here off the coast of Russia near Japan, etc. Uh, yeah, we've got some really, really wild card anomalies going on, and so it's no wonder that the weather is responding accordingly. And yes, there's more people with more of these to record everything, but don't let that lull you into thinking that we are not experiencing more extreme weather phenomenon, because we are, because there is more extreme stuff going on. Now, I'm not going to sit here and try to figure out the exact cause of it, because I don't know. We have some influence, and some of it's because of natural variance. Of course, of course. I think that's the best way to look at it. That's just my opinion. But the bottom line, though, I talk about this often, what are the impacts? And we're seeing those impacts already with increased flooding, rainfall that's ridiculous, these hailstorms, the severe weather that is still going on. There's pictures yesterday, I should have popped one up for you, of supercells, monster supercells over here in Kansas. I drew it big just to make sure I covered Kansas, right? That, like, that's a May shot, not mid-July. Uh, it's just crazy. So anyway, it, it's almost time for stuff to start happening, and we're going to have some problems. I really think we are. All right, so actual sea surface temperatures, for those of you playing at home, um, 28, 29 Celsius right up, up against the coastline. Chesapeake Bay nice and warm, starting to warm up towards uh, New England, the northeast and vicinity. Gulf of Mexico, again, uh, just crazy. There's 31 Celsius. There's 32 and then a tiny little area in here of 33 Celsius. No, 
It has never been that warm before since I've been doing this job of mine or watching these graphics even before I did this job professionally. So we're talking 25 to 30 years and uh, people that live down there, they know it has not been that warm before. Actual Fahrenheit temperatures were talking close to 100 degrees. And some of that water is very shallow, of course, and it's easy to mix and you can mix that warm water out but there's just more warm water surrounding it. Also, look at the extent of all of these 31 Celsius little areas in the Gulf and the rest of the Gulf, 30 Celsius. We're talking upper 80s. If we get a tropical cyclone coming into this area, A, there's going to be ample moisture to work with, so the rainfall rates could almost certainly be ridiculous. These precipitable water values, very important metric of understanding rainfall potential. And then, of course, if the atmosphere cooperates, a moist air column, light shear, uh, we could have explosive development in the Gulf of Mexico. It's starting to become worrisome. It is, and I'm starting to think of it in a, okay, we're going to have to be extra prepared this year, my team and I, because we could have some very violent hurricanes to deal with. Maybe not, hopefully not, but hope by itself is an inadequate planning tool. You have to think, and you have to think big sometimes, even if it's not pleasant. All right, just being serious with you. This is how I approach things. There's Don, tropical depression, not too much to worry about overall. Looking at the next few days for it. Going to do a loopy do out there and uh, of only concern to the shipping industry uh, in the North Atlantic. There's Calvin, dying away in the cooler waters of the Pacific, so not much concern there. I did want to show you here over in the Westpac. We've got this situation with our feature making landfall over, uh, I mean, it's imminent, and it's a typhoon. Uh, what would you call that? Talim? Talim? I don't know, but it is headed towards mainland China there, just southwest of Hong Kong. James Reynolds, uh, should have had a tweet from him, sorry, I, I try to do what I can, but I would recommend him. James Reynolds is probably covering it, I would assume I didn't check, full disclosure, I got a lot to show you today, but you know James Reynolds is over there in Japan, and he may have gone down there to cover this. Sorry, I don't know for sure, but follow him on Twitter if you haven't or don't. He's a great follow, by the way. So yes, there is some typhoon activity happening over in the Westpac. So globally, you know we've got Calvin, we got this typhoon, we got some activity in the Atlantic with Don, and the potential for something else to get going. So let's get on to that next part of today's update. We'll start by looking at satellite imagery. A little bit of a trough and a front has come off the east coast. Sometimes these can fester around and you get low pressure to develop over those warm waters. We'll wait and see if that happens. Nothing showing up in computer models, so I'm not too concerned. A little bit more organized convection in the southeastern Pacific. A little bit more of said convection near Central America. And as we redo the loop, there's a little bit of moisture out here. And we're going to talk about this in just a little bit because I'm heading out there on Thursday. We'll talk about that at the end. So let's slide the satellite loop to the east a little bit, courtesy of TropicalTidbits.com, of course. There's you some dust right there. You can see the outline of it on this amazing high-resolution satellite imagery. And then you can see the drier, more stable air in here. How do I know it's dry and stable? Well, I've done this long enough to know what I'm looking for, and that's what you look for, sort of that cumulus, uh, low cumulus field, that just screams dry air in the mid-levels. There's just not, the atmosphere is not unstable enough. It is very stable. That's a good way to put it. But that right there, we got to watch. That's a tropical wave coming off. The winds are starting to change and become a little bit more westerly over here, this monsoon trough. So that helps to induce a little bit of spin. And this is going to come off and try to keep its moisture envelope with itself and go across the Atlantic and it might try to do something somewhere out in this area. Put a big question mark for now. It's got to deal with all that air. So this is what we're talking about. Let's put this into motion. Uh, this is the European Ensembles off of the weathernerds.org site and this is the overnight run uh, and you see there's certainly some interest with our tropical wave here south of the Cabo Verde Islands I don't know off the top of my head if we're looking at 110 ensemble members now, or still 51 or whatever it was, but there's a fair amount of ensemble members. And again, why are ensembles important? 
just a refresher. If you ask one person their idea about something, an opinion on something, it's very one-sided, right? But if you can ask 50 to 100 people, you get a better consensus. Similar thing with these ensembles. If a lot of the different ensembles looking at different variables, you change the variables in the beginning to give you a different outcome just slightly, uh, more ensembles means more credibility in what could happen, more confidence in the forecast. You get it? So the fact that several of those ensemble members are trying to develop something from the Euro, the GFS has been kind of weird this year, kind of overdoing things again. So I'm not completely sold on when I see the operational or even the GEFS, its version of this ensemble forecast system. This is the ensembles, the EPS, I think, the ensemble prediction system. I'm throwing a bunch of words at you. Bottom line, the ensembles here getting a little bit excited, as it would be called, you know, is one way to put it, lighting up, whatever. So we're going to have to watch. We're getting towards the time of year that we're going to have to do such things, especially this year. And uh, a great tweet here uh, from Nikhil. I think that's hopefully how you say his name. A tropical wave will, I like that term, messily interact with the monsoon trough off of Africa. Great infographic, all these annotations that he added. Through the next several days, lots of sal will be present. I showed you that. But the environment will otherwise be favorable for gradual tropical cyclogenesis or tropical cyclone genesis as the wave and the moon monsoon trough consolidate into a single feature somewhere out in the open Atlantic. And he says one thing going for this disturbance is the convectively coupled Kelvin wave, that guy, that's forecast to push through the Atlantic in a few days. This should help to provide a convective boost. It makes me feel a little bit more bullish on development. We shall see. This is the Hovmuller diagram. He's kind of annotated it there. A little bit of this energy coming across that shot of Red Bull that I often refer to this as when I talk about these things. So let's look at it. As I've already besmirched the GFS here, this is the operational GFS from today. And we'll just kind of see, okay, how's it doing? Maybe it's going to do better with deep tropical systems. I don't know. I mean, it overdid Brett and Cindy quite a bit. Um, so we shall see. So what are we looking at? Well, here is the energy right over here. It's hard to, to tell. This is the initial conditions. So let's drop me out of the frame and we'll put this into motion frame by frame over the next few days. Keep an eye on the circle and let's see what happens. This is 24 hours out. So this is tomorrow morning uh, through Wednesday and so forth. So we're out at about three days now, Thursday morning. And you can clearly see as I erase my annotation and add some more, I've got this little pouch in here, this little envelope of energy. The convectively coupled Kelvin wave is probably in there somewhere. You got very um, light winds, even westerly winds coming back this way. Easterlies up here and there's your broad turning. Uh, pretty telltale sign that something's trying to get organized. That's Don, by the way, in case you were wondering. Sitting up there might still be around in a couple of days. We'll see. Finally out to 96 hours. Maybe some more convection with our system in the Atlantic there. Slow mover. And why not? The uh, high pressure of the subtropical ridge isn't screaming right now. Finally, by days five and six, and all the way out to day seven, we'll do 168 hours. Um, Got to get used to that because the Hurricane Center now issues their tropical weather outlooks to seven days. So we might as well look that far out ourselves. Is that really what it's going to look like in seven days? Tune back in next Monday to find out, right? It is interesting because ensemble support is there from various models. The Atlantic is anomalously warm. Like there's a lot of reasons to believe we might have to really watch this. Now, let me show you this interesting post over from our friends at Storm 2K. I was perusing their indicators thread, as we call it. And uh, the, what I just showed you is the GFS. This is the EPS. The mean or average 500 millibar geopotential height and anomaly. All right, really cool to see this. It's almost like a balloon getting stretched out and inflated. That 594 height line, beautiful example of solid subtropical ridging going across the Atlantic. And then these reds give you the idea of anomalous heights in the atmosphere. And remember all that warm water that I showed you up here way over at the beginning on this graphic, we're talking about this right here. Well, I find it interesting, and is it coincidence? Don't know, that the heights are highest or 
the anomalies. So what does that mean, just real quick? The atmosphere is thick, right? It has weight. It's like a mountain of air. And the heights in the atmosphere, we can measure that. In meteorology, we use these ISO, um, sorry, the height lines. I almost said isobars. The height lines help to measure that like contour lines on a geologic survey or something like that. And the thicker the heights are in the atmosphere, uh, they show up as darker reds on Levi's legend, means that there's just more air. It's a thicker air mass, more ridging. And that's very easy to see here with these anomalies. And I just find it curious that those anomalies are showing up where that anomalously warm water is. Is it a coincidence? I don't know. We'll see, right? But yeah, pretty solid ridging on the EPS as we go out into time. That's uh, days 10 through 11 through 15, so the next couple of weeks. A little bit different than the GFS, which is showing some little doohickey over here in a week. It's ridging system right there. This is the lower levels of the atmosphere, but the EPS seems to be more aggressive with ridging than does the GFS. So we shall see. All right, real quick on this, because, I mean... Who's not hot right now? I guess pretty much everybody is. Excessive heat warnings, heat advisories, you name it, it's happening. Records being set, record rainfall, a warmer atmosphere holds more moisture. And even down here in South Florida where everybody's like, oh, it's always hot, we're used to it. The other day, I think they had an excessive heat warning for Miami-Dade. I think it's the first time the Weather Service Office has ever issued one of those. These sort of pink colors here, you had one of those right there the other day. That's how hot it's getting, all right? This is starting to be starting. It's well past serious, in my opinion, but we're bordering on ridiculous, and it's really taking a toll on people, all right? And then, of course, it adds to more misery when you throw moisture into the equation and you get something to wring that moisture out. You get the excessive rainfall, people being swept away, Pennsylvania, lives changed, lives ended, upended. It's very, very disruptive, but the heat also very disruptive and very dangerous but part of that is also the pattern we get the monsoon flow and I think that's very fascinating so all that means that on Thursday I'm gonna be traveling out through Charlotte etc where I spent the night the other night I'll get to that in a minute and I'm gonna fly out to Vegas and then we're gonna hop the mountain go to Pahrump where we're gonna meet up with a couple of colleagues we being me and we're gonna set up our Starlink system and travel all around the southwest for several days testing things covering whatever monsoon or heat action there is hopefully streaming live all the time using Starlink we did some preliminary testing back in the spring early summer now we're doing some more in-depth testing that's one of the purposes that I will be accomplishing that's one of the reasons I'm going out there you say oh you're going to Vegas all right hey look I used to live in Vegas a long time ago other another lifetime I've been there a lot of times. There's time for Vegas, and there's time for Vegas and work. And I know you might be going, ha, 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 whatever. My people know I go to work, and I'm working. But anyway, it's an amazing area out in the southwest. I'm hoping that there will be some monsoon action, because we do want to sort of capture that as well, maybe tell a story. A couple interviews I want to try to get with some people out there. Work. It is work-related as we expand more beyond just covering hurricanes. That's part of that overall plan all right so stay tuned I'll talk more about that probably on Wednesday's update now let me go back to my title card real quick before I jump over to the last tab on the screen uh, as you may remember early in my career for those of you that know my story I had a great partnership for several years with Lowe's Lowe's home improvement stores we also have one with Sprint who became T-Mobile and these partnerships come and go for various reasons and a couple of sponsors from time to time. Sponsors versus partners, kind of like um, a partner is more of an educational long-term program. A sponsor, to me, is more like here's a logo, some funding, and just kind of have it out there. Thank you very much. Whereas a partnership is just more integrated, I, I think, is a good way to look at it. Um, so I am very pleased to announce a new partnership. Uh, I was up in Rhode Island. I got contacted several weeks ago by a company up there in Pawtucket. Hopefully that's how you say it. Pawtucket. I learned it's not Pawtucket. Just north and east, roughly, of Providence. And this company is called um, Absorbent Specialty Products. And then their main product is called Quick Dams. 
we have a water problem. And this fits right in with what I've been talking about for the last couple of years, that more and more issues with storm surge, freshwater flooding. And this company contacted me, I met with them, and we have formed a partnership. So for the next year, hopefully longer, we will be educating you about flooding through a lot of different ways. So instead of just pitching a product, I never did want to just be a pitch man. Um, nothing wrong with pitch men. Some of the most famous ones, Billy Mays, whoever. That's the most famous one I can think of. The Flex Seal guy, right? Um, this is different. This is more of an educational process with something that can help you mitigate against flood damage because flooding is a very incessant big problem. You say, well, I don't live anywhere near water. I'm tuning out. I don't care. Well, if you have water running in your house, and I think everybody watching this video does, then you have a potential flood problem. And I know that sounds, oh, of course you're going to say that. That's what I thought. I went in thinking, I know pretty much everything there is to know about flooding, but my eyes were open big time. And over the coming weeks and months, I'm going to introduce you to the company, some of their products that they have, which are amazing. Their whole marketing, their infographics, their promotional videos, you name it, I had no clue. And I'm pretty plugged into this stuff. There are other flood mitigation companies out there that I've come across over the years. This one has absolutely, no pun intended, swept me off my feet. They are already available, by the way, in some of the big names out there. You think Home Depot, uh, some of the uh, True Value, Amazon, right? That's a big name. I think everybody knows that. And others. So I just wanted to introduce you to it. I'm very proud of it. I'm excited about it. We're going to be testing some of their equipment, their products in the field this year in ways that will show how it works, not just to help sell product and help the company do better, but to help people. In the end, that's what I want to do. My whole goal is to help people. So finding companies that I work with, you know, I don't do a lot of it, and I don't actively seek out sponsors or partnerships. Every one of them have come to me first. Some I've turned down over the years, believe it or not. And um, this one I accepted, and I thought, wow, I cannot wait to tell you folks about it. So it's quickdams.com. Uh, you're going to hear more from them. I'm going to get their president, Carol, on on a Zoom call soon. And uh, we're going to introduce you to this amazing world. And I'm going to show you an experiment you know, coming up. Like It's really going to be interesting. And then you're going to see why it is an interwoven partnership and not just a sponsorship. Nothing wrong with sponsorships. Look, I realize those are important. But I really believe, and they'll tell you, I mean, you're going to get to know these people. When I left, I was just brimming with ideas and excitement because I knew I had found something through them finding me that could really be helpful in the long-term strategy to fight against a wetter world. And my phrase is, and I, I came up with this, we're going to fight water with water. You know how they say fight fire with fire? I'm not kidding. Fight water with water. What does all that mean? Well, you have to stay tuned to find out. We're actually going to have some giveaways as well uh, through YouTube. I've never really been able to do that. Now we will. I look forward to doing that in the future. So there's the introduction. That's what I was doing. Real quick, the weather, <laughs> I mean, come on, right? Why not? Caused me to miss my flight from Charlotte to Wilmington Friday. I, uh, I finished up. I visited with them Thursday and Friday, and I was done. And I was like, okay, I'll go ahead and fly home early. And uh, the airport and everything's like real close to their offices, so it was easy to get back and forth. So I went to the airport, uh, an hour delay, two hours, three hours, four hours, and I missed my flight. It was all from weather, like Fort Lauderdale, Boston, Newark. And, I mean, you've seen it. You know, Fox Weather's been talking about it a lot, too, that the northeast corridor for flights has just been a real foobar. And it was certainly that for me. And in the 30 years that I've been doing this job, and I have flown a fair amount, I've never missed a connection because of weather or any reason at all until Friday night. I got from Providence to Charlotte, got into Charlotte around midnight. My flight to Wilmington had long since left, so I had to sleep on the floor of the Charlotte Douglas Airport. Now, before you go, oh, whatever, dude, no big deal. It really wasn't. I had their little duffel bag that they gave me, and I used it as a pillow, and I found uh, a friend. There was a little mouse that came by, I kid you not. Maybe I'll show that video on Wednesday. A little mouse. 
Uh, reminded me of the Green Mile. What was it, Mr. Jingles or whatever? But anyway, I made it back, and I was very excited to tell you guys about this. But really weird being stuck at the airport and having to sleep on the floor. At least I could empathize. I think that's important with what people have to go through when they get stuck on the floor of an airport because of weather. If it's a technical problem from a major carrier that has a computer outage, there's nothing I can do for you there. But when it's weather, you have my sympathies. All right, this was lengthy. I do appreciate your time and attention. we got a lot happening, a great future ahead. Again, welcome to Quick Dams as our new partner. You'll hear a lot more about them in the days, months ahead, and so forth. And I am so excited. You guys have a great rest of your Monday. I'll be back tomorrow with you. We'll talk about more then, all right? I'm Mark Sutter, Hurricane Track. We'll talk again tomorrow afternoon.